Chapter 16 resumes our discussion of group three. Okay. This is the first video for chapter 16, where we think about those other two carbonyl functional groups that we've been ignoring in chapter 15, right? aldehydes and ketones. So we'll now bring those into the fold in chapter 16, as well as looking at some more reactions of the carboxylic acid derivatives that were introduced in chapter 15. Okay, so this first video kind of just gives us an introduction to these new groups and discusses nomenclature. Okay. And then the subsequent videos, we'll talk about all the different reactions we can expect in chapter 16. Okay. Previously, looking at our carboxylic acid derivatives, this is what's showing up top here, okay, we had something as a leaving group that was more electronegative, right? like a hydroxy group and a carboxylic acid or an alkoxy group in an ester. Now we're thinking about something that's either hydrogen or another alkyl group. So that thing isn't a good leaving group. So these derivatives, aldehydes and ketones, can't easily be substituted like they were before. And you should know this from the beginning of organic one, but in case it slipped your memory, right? An aldehyde is a carbonyl group surrounded by an alkyl group and a hydrogen. It has to be at the end of a molecule by definition. And then a ketone has an alkyl group on both sides of the carbonyl. Okay, the simplest one, we get a hydrogen on both sides, that's formaldehyde. These things are common in nature. Yeah. Here are a couple of examples from your textbook, right? They have some pretty significant odors. We worked in organic one with vanillin in the lab, right, which you've got over here, right? Got a ketone right there. They're common in nature. They're also common in our bodies. And look at these two hormones, right? Progesterone and testosterone, just a subtle difference there. Taking the alcohol from testosterone, turning it in, into a ketone, right, gives it a very different role in the human body, right? Just that little tweak in a molecule. So we see the biological importance of ketones and aldehydes. And that brings us to the nomenclature part. Right, with two new functional groups, we've got nomenclature again. How do we name an aldehyde? Okay name the parent alkane, cut off the last E from that name, and then you replace it with AL at the end. So you drop the E, you end AL. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, those aldehydes have to be at the end of a molecule. Okay, so carbon one is implied, right? You don't have to provide the number when you're naming an aldehyde. You're always assuming that that's going to be carbon one. So here we see a couple of examples. Remember, you'll only be tested the IUPAC names that are showing up top here in blue. Okay, we look at the carbon chain, right? Let's take right here, two carbons. I know that's ethane. I cut the E, give it A-L, pronounce it ethanol. You kinda gotta get nasally with these things so that you can enunciate the difference between an aldehyde and an alcohol, right? Because al and all can sound kind of similar to one another. But they're pretty easy to name if you're just writing them down. And if you encounter a common name, which are not tested, they're named just like carboxylic acids, except instead of ending in oic acid, we end it with just the term aldehyde. The only other thing to look out for, and I did mention this at the beginning of chapter 15, right? If you're using the letter nomenclature, the Greek letters, right? Alpha, beta, etc., the carbonyl group is not included there. So for example, right here on ethanol, this would be our alpha carbon, okay? C1, alpha carbon. Just look out for that with the letter nomenclature because that'll be important in our later chapters. If you do encounter two aldehydes in the same molecule, that's what we've got right here, it's called a diol, just like a diol, okay? Only other thing to pay attention to there, notice, right, the E wasn't removed, because the reason we remove E's in the first place is to avoid consecutive vowels, but because diol starts with D, the E stays in. If we have a ring with an aldehyde, it's a little bit different, right? You just name the ring, and then you state carbaldehyde at the end. So here, cyclohexane, the aldehyde, we name it not just aldehyde, but carbaldehyde. So cyclohexane, carbaldehyde, benzene, carbaldehyde, but I would like you to know benzaldehyde is a common name. 
What about ketones? Yep, same thing. We cut the E off of our parent hydrocarbon and replace it with one. O-N-E, pronounced own. Numbering now, you can number it from left to right or right to left. You just do it to give that carbonyl carbon that's in the ketone the smaller number. Only exception would be if it's a cyclic structure, then you don't have to give it a number because it's assumed that the ketone is C1. Okay, and the common names are not very common with ketones. The only exception would be you've used it in the lab all the time, acetone, right? Acetone is used all the time instead of propanone. But after that, it's pretty much just the IUPAC nomenclature. So over here, right, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons would give me hexane. I cut the E off of hexane, replace it with O-N-E, comes hexanone, and I number it as one, two, three, as opposed to one, two, three, four, because I want my carbonyl to have the lower number. Yep. And you can practice the rest of those that are on this slide right, to get that nomenclature down pat. Yep. The only time you might see these derived names that are shown on the bottom in black is they're useful when you've got phenyl groups on opposite sides of your molecule, yep. or on at least one side, rather. To get the derived name, all you have to do is name both of the groups that are on each side of the ketone and then just say ketone. And while the common names, which shown in red, aren't used all that often, the derived names for ketones you do actually see pretty often. And that brings us now, this was alluded to earlier in the semester, the part of nomenclature where we consider multiple functional groups that can control the suffix. Because we've seen now in chapter 15 a whole bunch of things that are named with suffixes alcohols are named with suffixes and now we have the aldehydes and the ketones as well so i have to know how to name these things properly All right and that comes down to this table 16.1 from your textbook these things have different priorities okay carboxylic acids are all the way at the top for our priority okay and then we list them on down from there whatever has the higher priority from this table is what controls the suffix name for the molecule Everything else that's in there gets named as a prefix. The only exception is if you have an alkene or an alkyne. We'll talk about those in just a second. So whatever's the highest priority controls the suffix, the ending of the molecule. And when you're numbering it, you also want that thing to have the lowest number priority. And you'll notice aldehydes and ketones here aren't named, or sorry, aren't as the highest priority. So now the question becomes, what if an aldehyde or a ketone got beat? How do I name it then as a prefix? Yep. And you use the prefix oxo. If it's a ketone or an aldehyde, you can use that same prefix oxo, O-X-O. So how do you figure out if it's an aldehyde or a ketone? Well, once you have assigned the numbering and gone out, right? if that carbon is in the middle of a molecule, like here, it has to be a ketone. Right? But if that carbon worked out to be at the end of a molecule with the oxo naming, then it has to be an aldehyde. So you can figure it out from that. Okay. And with the alkenes and the alkynes that I mentioned before, right? if you've got one of those in your molecule plus another functional group, right? and we've seen those before with like enones, okay? now instead of naming it as a prefix, Right, you can fold in your alkene or your alkyne nomenclature right in to the molecule itself, right? So instead of naming this with numbering the alkene and then ending it P, you know, pent A N A L pentanal, right? I can fold the alkene right in there and name it enal, pent E N A L. And it's that little E right there that tells you that you have an alkene in your molecule, okay, plus the number, right? Because you wouldn't have to number it if it was just an aldehyde. So three and the E tells you you have an alkene at starting at carbon three right here. Uh, so now, how do these things react? Yep. It starts out looking exactly like what we saw in chapter 15, because that carbonyl carbon is still electrophilic, right? We've still got that electron withdrawing oxygen. So we still have an electrophilic carbon right here in the middle of our ketone or an aldehyde. So it'll still react with a nucleophile. 
no different from before. Yep. Who's more reactive now? Yep. Aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. Okay, because an alkyl group, the R over here, is actually slightly electron donating, which would reduce some of that partial positive charge. Okay, so because the hydrogen doesn't do that as much, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones are. And sterics is another factor, right? Hydrogen is smaller, okay, so it doesn't block the approach of the nucleophile as much. Okay, so for both reasons, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. And the stability of the tetrahedral product is important as well. And I'm getting just a bit ahead of myself in terms of the slides. Right? But I've already said everything that's on this slide, right? So hydrogen's smaller. It's not electron donating. So formaldehyde would be the most reactive if you have that one situation where you have two hydrogens followed by aldehyde followed by a ketone, right? And the same logic, right? If you have a smaller ketone, the alkyl groups that are on each side of the ketone are smaller, that would be more reactive than something that has larger alkyl groups. But what I was alluding to before, right? That tetrahedral product, right? It's more stable if you had an aldehyde to begin with, right? Because when you go from your trigonal planar starting material, which was sp2 hybridized, to your tetrahedral product, which is sp3 hybridized, now these groups are closer together to one another, right? In the product, the tetrahedral thing. So an alkyl group likes that less than does a hydrogen. Yeah. How does it fall, fall into our reactivity patterns from chapter 15? Okay. Our aldehydes and our ketones are less reactive than our acyl halides and acid anhydrides, which were the most reactive things from chapter 15. Okay. But they are more reactive than everything else from the chapter, esters, carboxylic acids, amides, carboxylates. But the key word on that slide is reactive, right? They do react by a different mechanism than what we saw from chapter 15. So to put them all together across the two chapters, I've got this slide ranking them from most reactive up top to least reactive down at the bottom. Our acyl halides still reign king. Now we've got aldehydes and ketones at three and four. So how do they react? The next question, well, they do react a little bit different. That's why they have a different chapter, right? If I had still a nucleophilic acyl substitution, then that would mean Right? That's what we had all in chapter 15. That would mean I have to be kicking that group off. But H minus or R minus is way too strong of a base to be eliminated. So we don't do nucleophilic acyl substitution with ketones and aldehydes. They undergo an addition reaction. Right? This addition reaction, okay, and we do have to have a nucleophile that's a strong base in order to get it to go. Okay, But this addition reaction happens because I can't keep kick either of these groups off. And notice, right, that's my product here. Right? It gives us a tetrahedral product and we can stop there and be stable because there's no second oxygen, right? The tetrahedral intermediate in chapter 15 was unstable because we had an oxygen plus another electronegative group, right? We don't have that as much here. So we've got this addition product. We can get what's kind of like a pseudo substitution. It's called a addition elimination reaction because it happens in two steps or right? a substitution happens all in one, right? If we have an acidic solution, right? You have to have an acidic solution here to protonate and you have a lone pair on whatever your nucleophile was. So we're usually thinking about things that had oxygen or nitrogen where Z is right here. If you have that, a lone pair on your nucleophile and an acidic solution, right, so we can protonate in later on, then we can do what's called a nucleophilic addition elimination. Right? And the specific identity of this nucleophile controls what type of reaction we have, and that's the whole focus of the chapter. But what's happening here? Right? I had my nucleophile come in, form this product, but I protonate the OH. Now I have a good leaving group with water. So that lone pair can come down here, form a pi bond, and kick off water. But again, all those steps are in equilibrium. Yep. That's a powerful reaction because you can use it actually to form new carbon-carbon bonds. 
There's a couple of ways to do it. The most common one is using what's known as a Grignard reagent. Okay, so that's from chapter 11, something that we haven't covered yet. Um, so we're gonna be skipping a large part of section 16.4 this semester, is spring 2020, because we haven't covered chapter 11 yet. Okay, but it's not the only way to form those new carbon-carbon bonds using a Grignard. The next video is gonna pick back up with using the acetylid ion. And keep in mind, I mentioned this in chapter eight when we learned about the Diels-Alder reaction, forming carbon-carbon bonds are a big thing in organic chem. It's hard to do. So any way we can find a way to do it, that's something to make sure to pay attention to. Yep, but that's where I, I will pick back up our next video with uh, video two.